Hello everybody and welcome to our next talk, Chiaki bringing PlayStation 4 remote play to Linux with Florian Merkel. Let me introduce himself quickly. Um, he's a Radar 2 and Cutter maintainer out of Chiaki and he's studying computer science at the Technical University of München. So please enjoy his talk. So welcome to my talk about Chiaki which is an open source um, PlayStation 4 remote play client. First, a little bit about me. My name is Florian Merkel and I study computer science at the Technical University of Munich. And I'm also a maintainer of uh, the Radar 2 reverse engineering framework and its official GUI called Kata. This is also my uh, Twitter handle and my GitHub account if you're interested. So first let's talk about what remote play even is. And instead of uh, explaining it in detail, I'm just going to show you how it works. So here I have a virtual machine running Windows and I can start the official PlayStation remote play client. And I also have my PlayStation 4 right here, which is only connected over the network to this PC. So now I can connect to it. And what this will allow me to do is to simply control and play with the PlayStation over the network um, just like normal. I could also connect a controller here and then play my games. Unfortunately, um, these official clients are only available for a few platforms, which do not include uh, Linux. And they are also quite uh, buggy and unreliable. So the goal of Chiaki is to re-implement this whole protocol that they use to stream the game um, from scratch and then port it to many other platforms. Now, in order to be able to implement this protocol at all, we first have to know how it works. And luckily, since we have this official client and this official client obviously has to work, it must also contain all the information that is required for this protocol. Um, so what I did is I reverse engineered this client. So let's take a look at what files it comes with. So we have the main executable. This is just a .NET GUI around the actual code and the actual protocol is implemented in this one DLL here. So to extract some information from it, we need some kind of reverse engineering tool. And for that, I'm going to use Kata. So I'm just going to open this file in Kata now. I'm going to use some custom analysis because I want a bit less than the default analysis um, because I want to show a few manual steps later. Okay, so it's finished analyzing. Now here we can see it has identified many different functions, um, but just from this we can take a look at them, but it's quite hard uh, to actually know what's even relevant for us here. So what we need is some kind of uh, entry point where we can start analyzing uh, the binary that we know that we are interested in, and from that we can then explore the code around it and see how this all comes together. Now, there are many different ways to find such an interesting point, and I'm going to show you one particular. So this specific file is implemented in C++, and in C++, if you have a virtual method in a class, which means a method that could be overwritten by a subclass, then you need some kind of information at runtime to decide to which address um, to actually jump to when calling this method. And for this, C++ can generate so-called B tables. And these are just tables that contain a list of the function addresses of a specific class. And these V tables are also present in this binary and we can search for them automatically by doing some uh, heuristic search. In Kata, you can do this by just typing a B into the console. So we have found quite a lot of V tables and each of these B tables um, usually will correspond to a class. Now, in addition to these B tables, there's also more information because in C++, if you have, if you use the dynamic cast, 
then you need more information about uh, the class hierarchy, what uh, the base classes of a certain class are, and so on. And this is called this is stored in so-called RTDI structures. And these are located just before each V table. So if we go to this V table here, then here starts the V table. This is a function address, and this is a function address, and so on. And just before it, we have a pointer which goes to the RTTI information. And this, if, if this is present, this is quite nice because it gives us a lot of information about um, the class hierarchy, which we can use to analyze the code. So in Kata, we can use the AVRA command, which again does this vtable search and then tries to find RTTI information at each vtable. Okay, so it has found quite a lot, and we can see that we even get um, these nice readable class names. So these are the class names that were originally used in the C++ code. Um, and we can now use this information to actually uh, recreate um, a big part of the class hierarchy. So here we have the classes widget, which is currently empty, and we can type avrr. And this will, again, search for all this uh, RTTI information and then make a nice list of all the classes and the methods that it could find. Okay, so let's go through this list. Um, here we can find an interesting class that's called rpcryptaes. So we can assume that this class might have something to do with encryption. If we take a look at this, we can see it has found the vtable and it has found one virtual function. Now, not all functions, uh, not all uh, methods have to be virtual, so it only finds the virtual ones. And there may be, there may be many more. So now let's try to find some more methods of this class. First of all, I want to find the constructor of the class. Um, constructors of um, classes that have virtual methods usually um, need to take the vtable and store it inside the class object. So if we go to the vtable, right here, there's the vtable located. Then we can search for places in the code where this address is used in some way. So let's do this by using the extracts widget. And here are three locations where this is used. Let's take a look at the first one. Okay, this is a function. And we can already see here is a move instruction which puts this vtable address at some other location. And then it calls some other functions. Let's see what this is. Okay, this is um, apparently um, allocating something. In fact, this is the uh, new function of C++. So it's allocating more stuff. So it's we can we can assume that this is probably the um, constructor of the rpcrypt AES class. So let's add this as a method here. I'm just calling it uh, the same name as the class. So it's the constructor. And then I'm going to also rename this function here. Like this. And now that we have this, we can take a look at um, places in the code where this function is called, so where objects of this type are created. So let's do this. Now there are quite a lot. Let's take a look at, for example, this one. So here we are now in another function that uses this rpcryptAS class. Let's take a look at the graph here. Okay, so what we have to know is that um, due to how it's defined in the calling convention that is used here, when calling some kind of uh, method, the ECX register is used to transmit the so-called this pointer, so the pointer that points to the actual object that this method is called on. So here it's ECX where the constructor is called on and the constructor also returns uh, the address of the object. So 
this is returned in EX, and in EBX we then uh, move this pointer. So in EBX we now have our rpcrypt AES object. Now let's take a look at what is then done with this. So it goes through here, and then we have some mem set. Also due to the calling convention, if we have a call and we have pushes before it, uh, these pushes to the stack um, show us the arguments of the function in reverse order. So yeah, x here is the first argument, 0 is the second argument, and edi is the third argument. So this is a mem set which sets the address at eax in this case, which is esi plus 10, to 0 of size edi. So this esi plus 10 apparently is some kind of buffer, and edi is the size of this buffer. Okay, next we have this function here. If we take a closer look at it, um, it's doing some kind of mem copy, and in fact this is simply just mem copy s. We could find this out if we just um, take a look at this more closely. Okay, let's go back. And here we have a mem copy which goes into this buffer again, and it also uses this uh, EDI size here. And then further down, we can see again that our EBX that we have identified before is um, pointing to our crypt object is then moved into ECX here. And then this function is called. So this function is probably another method of the rpcrypt AES class. And if we take a look at the other parameters, we can see that the second parameter is again this buffer that we have memcopied and memset before. And the next parameter is this EDI, which is um, again the size of this buffer. So this looks quite interesting. We have a class that apparently, judging from the name, does some encryption stuff. And we have a method of it that um, takes some kind of buffer and a size. So now we want to find out what is actually what this method is actually called with at runtime. And we want to see the contents of the buffer before and after this function call. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use a tool called Frida, which lets us um, inject our own um, JavaScript scripts into a running process on some other machine. And then we can have callbacks at any part in the code, and we can read and write memory and print out things and do whatever we want. So let's go over here. And I want to write a script that we're going to inject into the real uh, remote play process. So make a new script here. At first, we need to know where this remote play DLL is located in memory. For this, we're going to get this address from Frida, like this. And next, we can attach some callbacks to this function that we're interested in, which is this one. So what we need is we need the address of the function. So we can write interceptor.attach, and we want to have this address on this base. So we use this base, and we add our address to it but only the lower bits. And then we give it an object which is going to contain our callbacks. So we have one callback which is on enter. And this is a function that just gets all the arguments of the function. And on leave, which gets the return value. Okay, so as we have identified before, we are interested in the second argument and the third argument, where the second is the buffer and the third argument is the size of the buffer. So first let's um, save these uh, two values inside our object, so we can also use it in the onLeaf callback. So we can just pull these arguments like this. 
and for the second argument we convert it to an integer. This isn't really an assigned integer in reality, but um, in this case it doesn't matter. And then we can read the contents of this buffer. So we just do the buff dot read byte array of this buff size. Next we want to print it, so we just do console.log. For some output and console.log with the contents. So this will be printed before the function is executed. And then we also want to print it after the function was executed. So we do the same here with after. And then we just add another new line to separate this nicely. And at the very end, we just want to add some more info so we can see that our script is injected correctly. So let's bring back the virtual machine here. On this machine, I can now start the Frida server, which will uh, which will let me use uh, Frida remotely from my host here. So this can run in the background, and I also want to have a Wireshark running, so we can see the actual network um, data that is transmitted from the client. So I'll use this filter here, and then I can start the uh, remote play client again. Okay, now everything is set up. So I can use Frida with the IP address of my VM here and the name of the executable and also the script that I want to inject. Okay, we see the output here, which we have written here. So apparently it has injected itself into the process. And now I'm just going to um, make a connection to the PS4. Don't ask me why this happens, it's apparently a bug of the remote play client. Okay, we're already getting some stuff. I'm going to cancel this real quick here. We don't need this to run anymore. So let's take a look at what we get. So let's in particular take a look at this packet here. This looks a lot like HTTP, HTTP. And if we take a look at the contents here, we have some stuff encoded in base64. So let's check what this, for example, means. So I'm just going to copy the value here. And then I'm going to convert this from base64 into just um, as a hex stamp. And we get AE14 AB something. Okay, let's take a look if we can find this. Yep, we have found it here. So this is the result that this function that we just found in Kata has produced from this data. And here it says Windows 10.0. So apparently this is um, really a function that encrypts um, data. And uh, we can now print all the unencrypted data that is um, otherwise completely unreadable in Wireshark. So this is one example how you can extract information from such a binary. There are many more techniques um, to use. Usually you will do a combination of uh, static analysis, how we have seen it in Kata, and dynamic analysis, which can be done um, as hooking, like here in Frida, or using a manual debugger like x64dbg. So now let's jump ahead and see a little overview of how the complete protocol works. So when a remote play session is started, it first makes a connection on TCP port uh, 9295, and here it does uh, some kind of handshake. And part of this handshake is the packet we have just seen that looks like HTTP. And then going on on this channel, we have a few things uh, like a heartbeat. And as soon as this initial handshake on TCP is done, 
another connection starts, which runs on UDP. And this one is the actual more interesting one. We have, again, another handshake that um, is performed here. And on this channel, we then have all the interesting stuff like video, audio, the input, and so on. Now, what's really interesting about these two different channels is that they are also very differently implemented. And the most likely explanation for that is that uh, the actual streaming part was not implemented by Sony, but by another company called Gaikai, which Sony bought a few years back. And what Sony then did is just take the code here, and they built their own PlayStation 4 specific um, stuff around it, like um, entering the sleep mode and so on. So in Chiaki, um, this TCP channel is called Control, and the real stream channel is called Tachyon, due to some uh, strings that can be found in the binary. So this Tachyon protocol is actually a very interesting one. If you take a look at um, how the packets are laid out, you might find out that it looks very similar to another protocol, which is uh, openly standardized, and it's called SCTP. This is a protocol that runs on transport layer, so it's something that you could run instead of TCP or UDP. But what they did is they took a lot of the um, things that are present in this SCTP protocol and put them on top of UDP and added some custom stuff to it. And one important property of both this SCTP and Tachyon protocol is that you can have both reliable and unreliable transport. Reliable means something like TCP, where packets that are sent are also guaranteed to be received, and unreliable is something like UDP, where you just send out packets and they may or may not be received, and they may also be received in any order. For reliable transport, you have these data frames, which also contain a sequence number, and the sequence number is then used to reorder the packets if necessary on the client. And there's also these data acknowledgement frames, so the server can know when a client has uh, received a frame, so it doesn't have to resend it anymore. And then there's also unreliable transport, which is used for um, like the input, uh, video and audio frames, where not necessarily every single packet needs to be received in order for the stream to work. So the entire protocol is quite large and complex, but we're going to take a look at one specific feature of it that makes it special for game streaming. And that is how video is transmitted. So this lineup here displays the different frames that the console renders, and it encodes them in H.264. And it does that by, at the start of the stream, creating one single keyframe, and then for every other frame, it only creates these delta frames, which only encode the difference between this frame and this frame. So let's see how such a frame would be transmitted from the console to the client. So at first, the console has this raw H.264 frame. And it splits this up into a number of smaller packets. And in addition to these packets, which are just um, directly the um, H.264, um, it also generates um, more additional packets by applying a technique called FEC or forward error correction. And we will uh, see in a minute what this is exactly for. But for now, it just uh, sends each of these packets through the Tachyon protocol using an unreliable transport. So it might happen that one or more of these packets just get lost in the network. So here we have received four of these packets, and now the FEC becomes important. Because now, as soon as we have received a certain number of these packets, in this case they are four, we can successfully reconstruct the original H.264 frame from it. And it does not matter which ones of these frames we have received, so it could be just the four original ones, or a combination, any combination of these. Now, the other case, of course, is that we don't receive enough packets to reconstruct it. So here we have just three. So because we can't reconstruct the original frame, we would get a glitch in our video. And the problem now is that because the console will always only send these delta frames, uh, this glitch would then always propagate forward and would never correct itself anymore. So what the client does in this case is it uh, sends the information that it has received a corrupted frame to the server 
and it does that not through an unreliable channel but through a reliable one. So it ensures that the server has received the information that uh, we have a corrupt frame here. And what the server then can do is it can generate another keyframe which is transmitted and as soon as the client has received this uh, the glitch will be corrected again. And this approach is one of the key differences that differentiates this protocol from something that you would normally use to stream from Twitch or YouTube, for example, because there um, a few seconds of delay aren't really a problem, but you don't want to have glitches in your video at all. But here we need to have as low latency as possible, otherwise we can't play at all. And we achieve this by having the compromise that we might get um, small glitches in our video from time to time. So that was a lot of theory. Now let's take a look at some demos with Chiaki. So I'll start Chiaki here. And this is the main window. It shows me the consoles that I've manually registered and the ones that are currently available on my network, which it automatically detects. So I can double click it to connect. And this is the screen of my PS4. Let's go into a game. And I have the gamepad connected to the PC right now and I can play it just like on a real console. You can also go into full screen mode. And this is currently running at 720p with 60 frames per second. Yeah. On the PS4 Pro you can Jesse. also get 1080p. So here in this game I can pick up this guitar. And I can select a chord with the left stick here and if I have selected one I can use the touchpad to pick the strings and if you look on YouTube you can find videos of people who actually uh, played real songs with this uh, which is possible but I personally am too lazy for that so instead of doing that I use Chiaki as a C library which you can do, which you can do because um, it exposes everything for streaming and control and so on in a public C API. And I wrote this little program. So what this does is it creates a new streaming session with some uh, connection settings, which contains like the um, remote IP address and stuff. It registers some callbacks for getting back the video and some events. And in parallel to the session running, it also uh, runs a thread that will then um, modify the controller state automatically and send it to the console. So if we run this program now, we can see that she now plays the guitar automatically. And this is all done just by controlling uh, the controller through the remote play protocol and getting back the video here. So that was a short introduction to Chiaki and its background. If you want to try it out yourself, you can just go to this URL. Um, the bot I've just shown is also available on GitHub if you want to play around with it and have fun. I mean, now. Okay, so Florian, thanks a lot for this wonderful talk. It was really interesting. And now let's see if we have some questions. Okay, so will Chucky likely work on PlayStation 5 too? So um, right now I can't make any guarantees, but from what I can tell, uh, it seems very plausible. So yes, very likely, um, but no ETA. Okay, we have another one. Have you thought about extending it more to code bots for games? Um, uh, not for myself. Um, basically, I mean, you have seen how you can use it to make a bot. Um, so if you want, you can pick up the, the example there. Um, I'm personally not that much interested in writing bots uh, for games. Um, so that's something that's up to the community, I would say.
but it's definitely possible if you want to make something like that. Okay. Did you have any communication with Sony about the work you are doing? Um, not directly. They, uh, interestingly, they did send me a, a job offer over LinkedIn that was specifically to um, game streaming. So I think they are aware of what I'm doing, um, but it was kind of also kind of generically formulated. So um, nothing came out of that. Okay. Uh, the next one. Since when are you working on Shaki? Are you the only developer currently? Um, <clears throat> I've started reversing this thing. Uh, I think around the end of 2018. So that took about one year of reversing on and off. And um, I think around September 2019, I've released the first version What uh, that um, worked. Um, so I'm the uh, only main developer, I would say, but there's a few people who also uh, help me a lot in reversing. Um, uh, shout out to um, Florian and Sven um, at this point. And there are also a few people, one who made a Nintendo Switch port, for example, and um, a few others who made some nice uh, pull requests. Great. Is it possible to run a game while another person is running another on the actual PS4? Um, if this is about running one game while the PS4, so, so basically running two games at the same time on the PS4, then uh, this is absolutely not possible. Um, of course, because you don't have uh, enough horsepower to run two games at the same time. Also, the um, streaming, it's really streaming exactly what you see on the PS4. So you just get one to one uh, that is what is output on the uh, on the display. But overall, um, the, the remote play protocol kind of works like a controller attached to the PS4. So what you could do if you have, for example, um, some co-op game that will require two controllers, then in theory, I think you could connect one controller to the PS4 directly. So one person will play on the TV and the other person could basically use remote play um, somewhere else. Um, but... Uh, I think they already uh, have built in some feature like that into the PSN where you can uh, stream um, with another person on their PS4. Okay. What was your motivation for writing Kota? Was it specifically to reverse engineer this or was it a pre-existing project of yours? Um, I, I did not write Kata. Um I'm just uh, one of the main developers of it right now. So um, basically, uh, Radar 2 has existed for, I don't know, 10 years or something. And I came to the project around 2017, I think, um, because I was um, starting out doing a bit of reverse engineering. Um, and I was looking around for disassemblers. And there's, of course, the uh, infamous IDA Pro, but that one costs as much as a, a car. Um, and I found out about uh, Radara 2, which was basically perfect for what I wanted. And it's a very uh, Unix friendly system. Um, but what was missing was uh, a, a nice GUI, which can sometimes be uh, beneficial depending on what your workflow is. Um, and then uh, Yaito, um, as it was called back then, was released by Hugo Teso. And this in the end became Kata. And I basically started um, contributing to Yaito um, at the time that it was uh, first released. And then I just um, got involved with the project and um, still continue to, to work on it. Good. Can you talk about how you extend the quality beyond the official app? Do you introduce better read rate settings beyond the official app? Um, yes, I have this bitrate setting in there, um, but I'm not sure if it really changes anything. So it's just a value that is sent to the PS4 
and uh, then the PS4 decides uh, what bitrate to send in the end. Uh, so you're limited, of course, in the sense um, to, to what the PS4 actually does. Um, I think the main benefit of Chiaki is simply that it's portable. You can use um, any controller that you like if you just um, adjust the code or whatever. Uh, also, there's a, uh, as already said, a Switch version, a nice Android version. And um, there's, there's also the issue with the original app that if you want to connect over the internet, um, then you have to go through the PSN. And for me, this uh, never worked, uh, not a single time. So um, with Jaki, you can just um, set the uh, manual IP um, that you have publicly and connect directly. Wonderful. Um, on which versions of Debian Jaki works currently? Um, it should work in theory pretty much everywhere. Maybe the dependencies aren't. Uh, available or you have to install a new uh, CMAC version or something. It's packaged um, right now, I think, on uh, Bullseye and SID. So um, there you can you can install it directly. Otherwise, you have to build from source and try to, to miss, uh, try to match the dependencies by yourself. But there's no okay. real thing that uh, prevents okay. it from running anyway. There is a Debian package already for Bullseye? Uh, yes. Ah, amazing. OK, let's see if we have more. Do you need to be on the last PlayStation 4 firmware to use Chucky? Um No. Uh, I only have one PS4, and I always keep it on the latest firmware. So that is the only one that's really guaranteed to be supported. Um, but I know that some people are running it on something like five point something. Um, uh, the protocol did change a bit uh, over time, but I'm trying to keep it as backwards compatible as possible if it doesn't um, mean any, uh, any major um, issues on the project. But of course, it's always a bit of an issue uh, if you don't have the hardware. Uh, to test it, so it's not guaranteed to work, but yeah, it should it should still work. Great. Okay, let's see if we have more questions. Well, it seems these are all the questions. Uh, would you like to add something else before ending the talk? Um, no, not really. Great. So thanks a lot, Florian, for your nice talk. Yeah, thanks for having me.